Have you ever been at work in a meeting or a seminar and had an overwhelming desire just to chuck it all in, run away and escape? I'm sort of hoping it's not happening to you right now. <laughs> but it occurred to me in the middle of a boardroom meeting of uh, one of the nation's largest companies. And I was sitting there sort of half listening to all the um, self-important chitter-chatter when it just hit me like a face slap. My health was shot, my work life had become my social life, I was travelling for five months of the year and my kids had turned four and two and I'd hardly even noticed that. Most of all, I was sitting there wondering, what happened to that dude who used to ride on the rooftops of buses across Africa, stow away in a Colombian cargo plane? What happened to the guy who vowed to live a life of adventure, yet now found himself chained to its treadmill? As soon as that meeting finished, I raced home to my wife and I said, we've got to get out of here, we've got to escape before it's too late. And so we did. We packed up the kids, rented the house, sold the car, and took off in an old motor home across Europe. And yet as sensational as that trip was, 30 countries from Central Europe to East Europe, the, ba uh, the Baltics to the Arctic Circle, North Africa and Turkey and back, what I didn't know then was that I'd just made my, f my own family the initial trial guinea pigs in what would become my long-term study into the rejuvenating power of time out. I wasn't thinking about that when we took off. My wife and I had another idea. We decided that we wanted to recreate old-fashioned family times. We wanted to hang with the kids, play outside, let them uh, build cities out of pine cones and use their imagination to create entertainment rather than having it induced for them by a screen. So we decided to go for a year without technology. No smartphone, no tablet, no Wi-Fi, no e-games. And it was fantastic for about three days. <laughs> and then e-tox detox set in. I soon found myself almost clawing at my eyes, desperate to make a phone call or an email, a message to anyone, someone, get a hit of Google. I was, I was, I was reaching for my absent phone as though it were a phantom limb. And suddenly, amid all this etox detox, here we were two weeks in, trapped inside this stupid camper van that was more like a can on wheels with two kids under four and my dream escape trip was coming, becoming more like some weird reality TV show. It was sort of like family survivor. <laughs> the only problem was that I couldn't get voted off no matter what I did. <laughs> and I tried very hard. <laughs> Without any choice though, we, we, did, we took off and we kept going. And over the next month we drove thousands of miles north through the, up to the Arctic Circle. Awesome driving days, over snow-peaked mountains, through 30-mile road tunnels, and plying the, the, the world's greatest fjords. The strange thing was, though, we were powering along like we were almost on some unstoppable runaway freight train. Yet, yet, the, yet the, the, the reality was that we'd been steaming along for months, maybe years, always busy, always something to do, filling in time like it was an engine that needed to be stoked. Up in the Arctic, though, we did slow down. The train stopped rolling. And, and soon I found myself chatting with my wife like we hadn't done in years, playing with the kids and getting to know their, all their teddy bears by first name basis. And soon, soon every little experience became that much richer. Amid all this sudden uncluttered mind space, I dug up an old unrequited dream of mine, one that was buried somewhere on the path of responsibility in life to be an author. I didn't know then I was going to write an award-winning memoir or have it internationally published. But I discovered and was rejuvenated with this new quest and vowed that I wouldn't die wondering, for there are a few things worse. <coughs> once, once we got on the road, that quest became clearer and clearer. And yet, I wasn't the first person to discover that time out can lead to a great idea or clarify goals. Benjamin Franklin, Picasso, Mozart, Churchill. 
All those guys were renowned for taking time out during their working days and weeks to get away and clarify their heads. Yet, of course, those guys didn't have to deal with the two great time munchers of our modern era, technology and 24-7 busyness. When I uh, told my daughter recently that the iPhone was only released in 2007, she just looked at me and said, Dad, life must have been so empty then. <laughs> Rising to her challenge, I hit back with a quote by Socrates. Beware the barrenness of a busy life. She was still staring at me, so I converted it to her modern day language. I said to her, we have to hashtag chill out more. <laughs> she got that. But Socrates' point has never been so apt, because we are now in a technology fueled epidemic of time filling. Japanese schoolgirls screen up 97 hours a week. Western kids average 59. Technology addiction centres are springing up all across the world, 300 of them in China alone in the last three years, to address internet overuse outcomes such as academic decline, attention deficit, anxiety, social withdrawal and so forth. And for the, for the working adult, connectivity 24-7 and checking messages at home, on holidays, in restaurants or on weekends is now becoming the norm. Ensuring we never escape and we never get away. It's not all bad though. Some of us do manage to go on holidays and sleep, not tweet. It's just getting a lot easier to recognise them. In a previous era, not so long ago, time out happened just by driving around in the car, going to the beach. We had plenty of space to think, dream and create. It happened naturally. Yet today, an age of constant connectivity has created an age of constant distraction. And to borrow a buzzword that's raging across the future frontiers of the business world, we've become disruptors. The problem is, we're disrupting ourselves. So what are we going to do about it? Because we can't all just jump in a camper van and drive around the year to, uh, world to get a, some new idea. And even if you can, you've still got to make it happen back in the busy world. And you're certainly, we're certainly not going to turn off technology because it's too good. Well, the ultimate solution then lies in how we manage it, how we operate. For if we accept that time out will no longer happen naturally, then we, we will have to deploy it as a deliberate high-performance strategy. John Cleese offers us a model solution. For he talks a lot about the secrets to innovation and creativity and how he says that he was less talented but produced funnier, more original stuff than all his Monty Python peers. And he says that creativity is, is not a talent, it's a way of operating. And of his structural tips to that way, three are time, time and space. The first time being about committing to a specific time every day. The second time about a minimum period of time, 60, 90 minutes, because you can't invent or change anything in 10. And the third, space, being about sealing yourself away in a quiet oasis, away from the world, away from the distractions, away from the pings and rings. And it's, it's sort of amazing, the ideas that can then come ripping into your brain when it's in that open-minded, playful mode. With my book out, I was on uh, radio and the interviewer asked me, how did my wife and I manage to have intimate relations in our caravan for a year while travelling with two kids? I said to him we couldn't discuss that on national radio, but instantly I had an idea for a, for a caravanning book sequel once our kids left home. I thought I'd call it Fifty Shades of Grey Nomad. <laughs> I can't even imagine what the movie would be. But, um, <clears throat> This type of time out in the corporate world is often referred to the jargon as being working on the business, not in it. And there are some fantastic examples. Bill Gates is renowned for his Think Weeks, where he gets away twice a year, seals himself off, away from all distractions, and works on fresh ideas. And many of Microsoft's yearly innovations are directly attributed to his Think Weeks. Google and 3M give their scientists up to a day a week to go away and work on anything they want creatively. 
the post-it note and scotch tape were two inventions that uh, came from such a process. But, but it's not the um, sole domain of world leaders and big companies. I was once involved in an electronic test of a global public company's top 2,000 highest performers. And that test measured energy, high energy levels, as an indicator to high performance. And of the participants, 95% failed the test, including the entire company's executive and board. For the test measured energy levels on a consistent, sustainable basis, and yet every one of the high performers had one thing in common. They, they worked as sprinters. They would surge and rest, surge and go again. Like Mozart, build, building micro breaks into their day so they could strike at peak when required. So next week, when you're lying on the floor of your office or lecture theatre, and your boss walks up to you or professor and starts screaming at you and asks what the hell you're doing, just tell him that you're preparing to peak. <laughs> In the future, as time out becomes rarer, more valued, and recognised as the very bedrock for rejuvenating relationships and lives, for creativity and innovation, it's going to develop as its own growth industry. It's already started. An explosion in digital detox holidays, slow movements like slow food, apps for teaching us mindfulness, and artists downloading net blocking software so they can deliberately make sure that they avoid distraction. The ironic thing is that in the future, we're going to have an awful lot of business and technology developed to help us stay away from busyness and technology. When my um, family, when we returned from our year on the road, my family went out one day and I was lying on the floor wondering how we were going to retain this bubble of connectedness, this awesome thing that we'd achieved on the road back in the real world, how we were going to create an ongoing life of radical aliveness. But I wasn't worried because I'd discovered the solution and it was through the power of time out by unleashing it in all its forms, short and long, daily and yearly. And so as I lay there contemplating my mad new writing quest at the time, wondering was it some folly or unachievable fantasy, I realised then that whether you're 18, 38 or 68, life's absurdly short and we must use our time to chase our real dreams while we can. That's what I'm going to do. I hope you do too.